And I got this high dome piston motor though. If if you want to run it, just don't finish in the top three. My dad's like, this thing hauls ass. So he thinks he's running fourth. He's really running third. Well, the two leaders take each other out. The uh, Gino gets black flagged, and my dad wins the race. And he's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. He's like, this would never fucking happen if my shit was legal. Hey, what's up? I'm Freddie Kraft, and this is the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Can I drive you? Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the show, and we have Freddie Kraft from Door Bumper Clear from Dirty Mo Media. He's also the spotter for Bubba Wallace in the NASCAR Cup Series, and uh, also a, a guy we also know from the Long Island days of racing at Riverhead Raceway. So what's going on, dude? Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me, man. I've been uh, <laughs> I've been following along. You've been on a roll here lately. Uh, ran into you last week, obviously, at Charlotte, supporting another one of our friends from uh, back home, Steve Halpin and his son Reed at the Summer Shootout, and put this deal together to come on this week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, good. We're, we're happy to have you here. I mean, I, your your show is blowing up. Your door bumper clear is uh, like what? You're in one of the top five racing podcasts in the country, I, I think. Is that yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care. I, I mean, it's tough to say. You know, I don't. As long as it's good, we have fun doing it. People seem to react well to it. It really doesn't matter to me where it's ranked. It's probably up there somewhere, I would assume. But, uh, man, as long as it's fun and it keeps being fun, and, and me, we have a we have a blast doing it, and and people seem to love it every time we go out the racetrack. You know, our Charlotte, wherever we're at. You know, it's some people come up and say thank you for the show, and I'm like, no, thank you for listening to the show. Right. We're just sitting in a room, you know, bullshitting like we normally would on the roof, right. and we and we just kind of opened that up and, and kind of brought it to the public a little bit more. And it's uh, it's awesome because that's that's kind of like what we try to do here too. We, you know. We we do we talk real uh you know we try to have people on from all walks of, of racing too but our show is more of lee more intimate one-on-one -on -one conversations so actually you know i mean i i'm familiar with your background because we're both from you know back home in long island but uh how did the whole door bumper clear c come about i mean you, you went from st spotting to now being you know one of the hosts of a show <laughs> yeah so obviously I was, i've been spotting for bubba for a long time and doing bubba in the cup series and uh uh, TJ Majors, who used to be Dale Jr. spotter, Dorbum Clear is on the Dirty Mo banner, which is owned by Dale Earnhardt Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, he was Dale's spotter for a long time. And they decided that they were going to start a podcast, the Dale Jr. Download, which still is going today with Dale Jr. hosting. And now, originally, Dale wasn't the host. He had some buddies come on there. Mike Davis, TJ popped in once in a while. Well, then they decided to they want to do one with some spotters. And TJ was obviously the choice. And then they decided, for some reason, they were going to include Brett Griffin. I think it was maybe his outspokenness on some topics on, on Twitter that they were like, well, this probably make for good television, at least. He <laughs> is entertaining. I will definitely give you that. Um, so they did it for a while together. And I'm obviously very good friends with both of them. I'm, I'm really good friends with Brett. And uh, he... He asked me to fill in one day. TJ was going to be out or something. So it was basically, it's like this, you know what I mean? It was just me and Brett on there just kind of bullshitting back and forth. And, and it got a good reaction. So they're like, oh, you know, maybe maybe anytime somebody's out, you know, Freddie can be our fill-in guy. So we did that for a while. And then I kind of parlayed that into, you know, all right, now every once in a while they would do it with the three of us. So we were doing a couple episodes a year with the three of us, and the, one of the presenting sponsors was like, hey, you know, this is going pretty well. Why don't, would you be interested in even doing full-time? And I said, yeah, obviously I would. And that's the show really took a giant step forward when they, they made me full-time, I think. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, told, I told you yesterday, you know, it's I tell everybody all the time we have a, a really good dynamic on that show because I, I feel like, you know, TJ, if you ever listen to our podcast, TJ – is deathly afraid to make anybody upset, and Brett is on the other end. He wants to piss everybody off. So I'm, I try to, I try to kind of find myself somewhere in the middle. No, you, yeah, like I said yesterday, you're, you're like the common sense guy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I understand. And the show looks like it's so much fun to do too. Besides, you know, just enjoying what you do. Uh, um, do, uh, do what are the, what are some of the, the backlashes or some of the, the, the trouble that you've gotten into? Because I, I know you guys are outspoken, <laughs> and you have to be very careful when especially in the sport yeah you know they, they the the i think they we, there was one time we got called to the hauler it's it's been you know notorious on our show that it gets mentioned uh we did you know cross a line probably and, and when we got called to the hauler it wasn't a reprimand it wasn't a what was you it? know it was i don't even remember what the hell we got called for what set them off but it was more or less a we're gonna bring you in here and like we were never 
we never had a communication with them to present their side of the story. They never wanted to come on the show. You know, they never, they never wanted to, if we were critical of them, there was never a, you know, well, you didn't give us a chance to respond, you know? So that really just opened up a really good line of communication for us where we now had, you know, uh, contacted their comms people of why did you make this call? What, what are you, what do you want to present? What do you want me to present tomorrow on our show? That's, you know, we're going to be critical of it, but here's why what they were thinking, or you know, so that that was where it started off, and you know, and then sometimes you know I'll I'll be a lot of times we go to Big Al's after a race on Sunday, and maybe I'm not in the best condition at nine o'clock in the morning on Monday, and I'm not <laughs> thinking right, and uh, and there's been times where I've been overly critical and probably stepped over the line myself, and they they're like you know we, every once in a while we get the old you better rein it back in a little bit comment, and then we got to be on our best behavior for a couple of weeks, and then somehow we trend ourselves right back to getting into trouble, but you know I think that's a por- important part of it, and you. You've been you've been in this sport long enough. You know it too. You can't all just be politically correct. We can't all just you know rah rah everything's great. And you also can't have a panel where everyone is agreeing with each other too. You know because that just makes for it's boring television. You only get you don't get any t- talking points or different opinions or views. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, that's what I do like about the show is that yeah, you, you the dynamic between them because you need that. You need someone to sit there and say no, I be- think this and. That's what's what it's going to be. Um, it, <laughs> where do you hope to go anywhere with the show after spotting, or do you, is it just for you? This is just a fun thing. Yeah, I mean, right now, obviously, it's just a fun thing. You know, right. it, we're not getting rich off it by any means. You know, we're 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 enjoying it. It's fun for us now. You know, it's it's never it never hurts yourself to put yourself in front of a camera and show that you have you know some kind of speaking skills and you know it it might open up doors down the road where you get some kind of tv deal we you know we actually took it to tv a couple years ago we were on mav last year Mm -hmm. we were on some dirt vision and uh you know so there's there's a production value to it and 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 there's obviously it could open up doors obviously i'm not i'm banking on spotting being my career right you know that's that's where i'm gonna be but who knows you know i'm I'm already noticing that you know maybe my eyes aren't as good as they once were so (laughs) there's gonna have to be some kind of retirement plan and maybe this is it but yeah we're just right now we're just having a lot of fun with it you know it's good though to have this as part of your resume because you can you know like you said if you don't want to spot anymore if you get tired of going on the road there's other avenues for you to try so yeah. there there is that uh kind of like with, with this television has changed so much uh, this business now um they are only putting certain people on air so now if you want to be on on air you got to put yourself on air so um we're seeing that with this show. The show is growing. We're we're happy about that. Uh, I'm jealous as hell of your numbers. <laughs> I mean, I see you tweet something. I see you tweet something or post something, and it's just like right, right up through the roof. And I'm like, man. And I'm like, and I get six likes. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Holy shit. That's the, the Dale Junior effect we call it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, it's it's fun to do though. But the cool part about this compared to doing a TV show back in the day is that. We can watch the numbers grow ourselves. We can see the the followers growing, the likes growing, the you know the viewers growing, things like that. You know, like if Dave Moody retweets something that we we put out, a small clip, it gets thousands, tens of thousands uh, of views compared to if we had just been able to just put it out ourselves. So yeah. I understand that that link of having those social media numbers and people to help yeah it's it's fun to, you know and it's just fun to watch you know I, every once in a while i'll go and check the uh, you know the 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 where we end up on the list of sports podcasts you know for the week episodes you know episode by episode and then you see some of the names you're around like yesterday i think we were number 18 in the in, on apple you know and i looked and it was you know bussing with the boys and and you know f- the barstool podcasts are around this and you're like it's so crazy how this world comes together and everybody intakes things differently and and where you fit in in that realm of the world you know like that would have even been a pipe dream three or four years ago to even be on that list and now you're you're creeping up with some of the people that you like you've been looked up to doing it so it's just it's like i said it's it's more fun than anything and it's just fun to watch it grow and and see the interactions with people with the racetrack growing and it's like i said it's just a lot of fun have you ever gotten any heat from the fans at the track like on a weekend and someone stopped you or anything no 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 heat from the fans they love it you know they think you know we you know we so it was funny tj is a little more sensitive than some of us and um we he, because of that we can pick on him a little bit easier you know mm-hmm. me and brett got thick skin you have to if you're gonna run your mouth as much as we do um but you know for some reason one of the calls one week was 
you know, the guy was just because we, we do a, a call in segment of the show where people can call in, and leave messages. And one of the calls it was just a guy breaking down the race. I love the race. Race was great. And then at the very end, for some reason, like signing off, he said, oh, and TJ sucks. And it was like, what? What the hell was that? But there, I mean, it got a huge laugh out of me and Brett. So because why that happened, you know, because of that, the next week it was every call. Every call was yeah, da, 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 the race was this, but TJ sucks. TJ every sucks. sign off, and I'm like, oh man. So that was like, that's the only heat we get at the racetrack is we'll be walking through the crowd and somebody will just yell, TJ sucks, and it's just they're they're not mad at it by any means, but it's just you know, it's a thing. And, and poor TJ, he's got to put up with it every once in a while. So, but it, it, it's just like an organic. Just one guy one day called and just threw a TJ sucks in at the end, and it turned into something like a, one of our catchphrases now. Uh, that, that's yeah, it's almost like a Baba Booey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the Stern show, well, or something. Poor, poor TJ. What happened with TJ was, you know, he spotted for Dale forever, right. and then so you are the most popular driver in the sport, you know. Well, then he left Dale when Dale retired to go spot for Logano, who was probably at the time one of the most hated guys in the sport. So that was just that it was a it was like a, a crash landing for poor TJ. Oh, God, that's <laughs> awful. So take us through uh, a weekend for you, or or I should say a week, because. Um, you you fly out when on uh, fr- a Saturday? Fr- uh, Friday mornings usually Friday afternoon. Um, so right now week Monday do the podcast. Tuesday, um, you know Tuesday Wednesday it's either you know some kind of race prep where we're going back watching the last race that at the track we're going to that week. Mm-hmm. Really not much going on during the week for me. Um, if there's a meeting they want me to come to, I'll go down to Airspeed and 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 hang out in the shop for you know whatever meetings they want to do um and then it's just really getting ready for the race that weekend i'll leave saturday or friday morning usually sometimes we'll have a truck race on friday night for you know practice and truck race for the trucks saturday is usually xfinity practice and race cup practice qualifying uh and then obviously the cup race on sunday and then we leave sunday night right after the race is over and fly back um so it's it's i mean it's not a it's i i we get shit a lot because we complain about off weekends you know and and right now we're in the mix of getting ready to do i think 23 straight weekends since the beginning of the year mm-hmm. and it's yeah i don't work much during the week you know what i mean i don't I, like when i complain about the schedule i'm doing it more so for the guys in the shop that are also traveling to the track because they only get you know a day or two off a week and they get no weekends no time to spend with their family if they are off during the week their kids are in school their wife is working you know they're not there's not a lot of family time you know because a lot of times it's the, the road guys will get a, a monday off you know because they've been working all weekend uh but what good is that to you if all your friends are working and your kids are at school and you know whatever right. so like it's a grueling schedule at times not so much for me i'm gonna be okay uh but yeah it's 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 a it's it can be a challenge at times do you do you still enjoy doing it or is it still <laughs> uh like work for so it, it, it's funny you know and you know this because you've lived it you know i tell everybody all time back you go to riverhead you know i'm going to riverhead in a couple weeks uh and everybody's like man your job is so cool and it's amazing and you're like yeah try it for about a year right. you know and it's right. like i mean it's like listen i would never in a million years trade my job for anything else mm-hmm. in the world but it's still a job at the end of the day right. you know it's it's still work nobody loves their job i love what i do for a living but i would much rather never have to work a day in my life Absolutely, you know? I get uh, it. you know, so you know, it, it's hard to travel. You know, you're we're gone. Which COVID, you know, that, that you know, COVID changed our schedule greatly because we used to fly out. We would be gone, you know, 200 days a year probably. Mm-hmm. And now we we took a day off every week of that. We used to fly out Thursday. Now it's at least Friday. Um, and it's it COVID helped a lot with that because it like limited the practice and and you don't spend as much time at the track. But you're still gone a lot. Like I said, you're gone. 40 weekends out of the year you know essentially so it's it's a lot of travel and it's you know it, it, listen the work's not for me spotting the work's not hard the hours aren't that bad it's more so the traveling that wears on you and it's and it's and it's like you said it's when you're doing when we were running you know you'd run 15 weeks at riverhead and you're like oh man that's a long season where yeah we're running 40 now you know right. so it's a it's a grind and it's a you know you're gonna have your ups and downs we're in the middle of a hell of a slump right now and it's and we're trying to work our way out but it's like not you know it, i tell everybody all the time you know kids racing people trying to get in if it's not fun you're not you know it's not worth doing it and sometimes it can wear on you to not be fun but you got to remember hey man I'm, I'm racing for a living and and this is a dream that of mine when i was growing up it, it's I, I get what you mean because i've been there before you know especially traveling 30 something weekends between modified K&N which is now ARCA but um, 
<clears throat> let's actually let's go back to you know some of the beginning stuff you know the early days uh, obviously i know who your dad is race figure eights at iso speedway won the very last race at iso speedway too uh he was a long time track official i mean and you were going to the races since you were a little kid <laughs> yeah yeah you know, remember watching your father win on espn <laughs> yeah yeah then he got disqualified then he got disqualified <laughs> <laughs> so that's a funny story because, you know, if, if you're not familiar with it, it was World Championship Day at Riverhead was the biggest, you know, figure eight mm -hmm. race in the world, you know. And it's now they sold the name and the rights to the Speed Drome in Indy, and that's, what they, that's the big race they run, the three-hour. Mm -hmm. But my dad had never won, and uh, so leading up to that, he had won the championship at Riverhead. And what happened was that race used to be – after the season, you know, it would be the week or during the week after the season ended. So right. championship day, they called it. Yeah. Championship day. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, the, you know, they ran, we ran Saturday night and my dad blew up. He won a championship, but he blew up in the last race and he thought he was not going to be able to run championship day. And he's, he's upset about it, you know? So, uh, he gets, and I, he gets, uh, he calls up John Betts, who was building mowers at the time, McBetts race engines. And he's like, man, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm not going to be able to run. You got enough, can you build it? Can you refix this motor? And John's like, no, I'm not going to have the pieces and stuff in time to get everything done. He's like, man, I got this high dome piston motor though. If, if you want to run it, he's like, at least get you out there, get you on TV, you know, get your, cause the race was on ESPN. Right. Um, and he's like, at least get your, you know, get your sponsors, some plugs and whatnot. He goes, just don't finish in the top three and you know, you'll be fine. Well, <laughs> Sure enough, my dad's like, "All right, I can do that," you know. So he, and the, my dad's like, "This thing hauls ass." Like if you if you go back and watch that video, he, he wins the heat race by like half a lap, you know. He, <laughs> they, there's no tech after the heat race, so he lets the thing eat and eat and he kills him. And then uh, so then we uh, we go in the race, and you if you watch the video, he's got to stay out of the top three or four there. So he's he's running fourth coming to the white. Well, Gino Terrapicchio spins George Brown out in the last corner. Mm -hmm. John Fortin, they get, he, my dad kind of gets lost with a lap car and thinks John Fortin's ahead of him. Well, it's a lap car. So he thinks he's running fourth. He's really running third. Well, the two leaders take each other out. The uh, Gino gets black flagged, and my dad wins the race. And he's like, you got to be fucking kidding me. He's like, this would never <laughs> fucking happen if my shit was legal. So if you if you go back and, and look at the Victor Lane pictures, I can show them to you. Right, no, you know, I, I remember. He's he's the only person in the picture not smiling because he knows he's cheating his ass off. And he's like, you know, he's like, he's like this shit would have fucking never happened. He said he, in the best part, he said he almost got away with it. I don't know, I know you know some of these guys, but uh, Luigi Terrapicchio, Gino's dad, mm -hmm. um, was very, they're very Irish people, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> yeah. For those that don't know, too, Luigi Terrapicchio raised figure eights, and he had an American flag and an Italian flag <laughs> on the roof of the car on both sides, you yeah. know, to re to commemorate his his original yeah. home in Italy and then his new home of America. So like I, I thought that was great. Oh, too. Yeah, it was, and you could always pick their cars Dude, out, you right? Know, and had the flags. So on them. they swore. My dad was winning. All, my dad won the championship, so they swore he had an illegal head on the car. So all year. So when they took the head off. They were, they, everybody was like clamoring around running for that. You know, they're like, oh, we got this guy now. We got the head off this thing. So they didn't even look at the pistons. And, <laughs> and my dad's like, Hold, cover that up. Cover that. Like, try to get that. And right before they covered it up, Gino's like, look at the Doma piston. Look at that. And, uh, you know, so that was how he got busted with that. But he was so mad. Like, in all the Victor Lane pictures are the best because everybody around, nobody knew him. at the time. I think my dad and maybe John Betts were the only ones that knew that the motor was in there. And, uh, you know, everybody else is so happy. And my dad's got no smile. Just won the biggest <laughs> race of his life. And he's got not even cracking a smile in Victory Lane. It's like, oh. National oh, television. Yeah, oh, yeah. Then he's got to go back out and do an interview with John Fortin about, about yeah, I didn't know anything about that. You know, it's. I uh, remember it's on, Fortin it's on, saying, I remember Fortin saying, yeah, I was happy for fourth, but I'm much happier for first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, he, we give him shit forever because he says more betterer or something. He's like, yes, first is more betterer or something right on the ESPN. So we gave him some shit about that for a long God, time. God, that was so funny. And there was also a fight. Was it Walt Detzel almost beat the hell out of him. Yeah. Uh, Ray Mortuan and uh, Danny Marcello. Danny Marcello. Yeah, yeah, modified Dan. Yeah. Big Bob comes out in his van and, and oh, you know, that God, was on national television. Yeah. Too. My dad, my man, my dad is you know talking about stories, you know. Obviously luckily unfortunately my dad passed away last year, as you know. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, you know, the, now I can tell some of these stories because the statute of limitations has run out. There's nobody that can do let's, it. This you is know? where we so, come for stories, so let's hear it. So uh, we're running I'm running I was racing, uh, and I'm out there practicing. And I don't know what my dad wasn't out there for some reason. We raced together. We both ran figure eights at Riverhead. So uh, my dad 
My dad, I see the gates. We're, we're out there running for middle of practice. Yellow flag comes out. There's nothing going wrong on the racetrack. We only run two or three laps. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Well, next thing you know, the gate, the turn four gate swings open. And I'm like, oh, somebody must be coming out. Well, yeah, it's my dad walking. He walks down the hill with his fire suit and helmet on. And I'm like, what the fuck's he doing? So he weighs me down. I go over. I'm like, what's up? He's like, my ship blew up. He's like, he's leading the points at the time. I'm just out there floundering around. He's like, I got to run your car tonight. All right, whatever. So he runs my car. Mind you, I'm a 16-year-old kid at the time. The first thing I ever drove was my figure eight car. But I never drove anything on the street. I drove my figure eight car. first. Really? Yeah. No kidding. I learned how to drive stick in the pits at Riverhead. Like, this is a disaster of a No year. kidding. Yeah. Not even tried so, mom's not, car around no, a parking not lot. Not even nothing. nothing. Just first thing ever, figure eight car, Riverhead Raceway. Oh, my God. So, uh, so anyway, so he goes out and practices. He finishes that practice in my car. He comes in. He's wearing me out. He's like, how come you didn't tell me this thing does this and this thing does this and the throttle? I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to know? I said, you know, like, <laughs> I've never driven it. I thought that's how they all were supposed to be. You know, I was like, I don't know. You you built this thing. I don't know. Why are you yelling at me? He's like, he's like the fucking return spring on this thing is like a garage door open. He was like, either wide open or all the way off. So whatever. He fixes it. Well, we don't have time to go on the scale. And we never scaled my car. We were never worried about me ever going to tech at any, at any point that year. Right. So my shit never got scaled or nothing. And we knew it was probably light. So he goes out there. Same thing. He runs up front. We threw a bunch of lead in it. Figured, you know, that's cl- going to be close enough. So uh, he goes out there, runs second. Well, all right, I'm happy. We're walking down the ramp, you know, back towards the pits. And somebody's like, hey, Fred, something's wrong with your dad. Uh, There's a medical problem out there. So I jump in somebody's golf cart. I run down to turn one, and I'm like, like, what's going on? They're like, I think he's having a heart attack, which my dad, if you know my dad, he smoked like a chimney. Heart attacks were not uncommon for him. Mm -hmm. Um, So I get to the car, and the EMS people are there, and they've got him unzipped, and uh, he's – got shit hooked up to his chest and they're they're monitoring and he's just laid back in the seat and while he's laid back in the seat he looks up i'm leaning in the window like you're right and he's and he looks up at me and goes like this and just winks one time and i'm like the fuck is he up to i'm like oh, i don't so i'm thinking all right well he knows we're probably not going to pass tech now like this is the problem <laughs> so sure enough they fucking load him up in the ambulance take him down to central suffolk <laughs> So now I'm like, I guess this is his way of getting out of tech. So I jump in the car. I drive it back to the pits. And they're like flagging me down at the scales. And I'm, you weighed the car after the race is over with the driver in it. So they're flagging me down at the scales. And I'm like, hey, we can't weigh this thing. My old man's in the hospital. Yeah, he's like he's, And obviously he's twice my size at this time. You know, I'm like, we can't weigh it. They're like, well, we gotta, you, you got to go through tech. And I'm like, well, what do you, I mean, you go get him. Call the ambulance. I'm going to come back. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Right. So. <laughs> they Roger Maynard won the feature that night. He he's on the scales. They push him off. They're going. Right, we're gonna. What we're gonna do is weigh the car without him. And then if it's close, you know, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, if, you know, if it's if it's what we think he probably weighs, you know. So we get on there like you're disqualified. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, he's got to weigh like 450 pounds. And I'm like, he's pretty big. I was like, you know, I, was like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what he weighed at the time. Probably like 280, you know, something like that. I was like, he's a big guy, you know. So. <laughs> So I call him. I'm like, yeah, they're DQing us. He's like, what do you mean they're DQing us? I'm like, they they weighed the car without you. They said you got to weigh 450 pounds. So obviously, you don't. I'll be right there. The next thing you know, my mom said he ripped all the damn EKG <laughs> shit off. <laughs> fucking goes running out of there. So now at the same time, I'm like, I don't know what. Like they're packing up the scales by the time you know this is the last race of the night. So I'm like, man, this is gonna be a disaster. So here he comes back, and I think Walt Bonzac was the was the ch- uh, tech inspector at the time. He says, Walt. He says, did you, let me ask you a question. You know, how are you going to disqualify me? He said, Tom, you know, it's light. He goes, it's three, you got to weigh like 400 pounds. He's like, did you move the scales after Roger car got off? And he's like, no. He's like, well, my wheelbase is two inches longer than his. I, you, that's why it's so light. You guys fucked up. So he's like, unload these scales. I'll unload, I'll unload the car and we'll go over the scales again. And I'm the whole time. I'm like, no, that's a, we're still going to be light. What the yeah. fuck are you doing? Like, we, I, we know we're light. You know, he's like, so then my dad's like, I got a better idea. He's always, you know, because they're like, no, we're not unpacking all this shit again. You know, my dad's like, all right, I got a better idea. You take the car. You keep it here all week. I don't care. We're, you know, it's Fred's car. We're going to have to be working on mine all week anyway. He said, so you just keep it here. And when we get here next Saturday, you unload the scales. We'll push the car on the scales and it'll be right. And I'm like, the whole time, I'm like, what is this guy doing? Like, this is this idiotic thing I've ever seen. So sure enough, that week, they agree to that. They're not going to do the payouts that night. They're going to wait till next week. So we get in a car to drive home, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, what the hell's going on? Well, he gets on the phone. He's like, call some guy he knows that works at the racetrack. He's like, 
let me know where that fucking car is. They parked it in some, like, they remember that they used to have them trailers behind the racetrack, behind the press box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They parked it in that yard somewhere. Well, Rick Swanson was our crew chief and just happened to be, like, a master fucking uh, burglar. <laughs> he, he breaks into the racetrack, oh, no. loads this car full of lead, and then when we get there the next Saturday night, they push it up on the scales, and sure enough, it was right on the money. <laughs> and my dad's like, I fucking told you guys. I said, I don't know why you didn't listen to me. We could have This all could have been done last week. And I'm like... Like, this is the most ridiculous shit we've ever done here at this place. Wow. And then, of course, we you go out for practice. Talk about putting on some theatrics. Oh, yeah. And then I go out for practice, and they forgot a piece under the seat. And I went into turn one because it was just thrown in there. Obviously, it wasn't mounted to nothing. And we go into turn one, and this thing comes slide. As soon as I step on the brake pedal into turn one at speed, this piece of lead comes flying out from underneath the seat and blasts me in the ankle. <laughs> and I wrecked my ass off because I was seeing stars. I thought it was going to knock me out. But, yeah, it was. Yeah, you had a big wreck at Riverhead, right? Uh, no, I, my dad did. My dad had one. I was in I was in the race with him. He got hit at the X pretty bad. I luckily I wasn't going fast enough to ever hit anything real hard. Uh, you know, figure eight racers they are a different breed. Oh. They, they really are. And you know, you got to have eyes in the back of your head. Yeah, you know. You know what's funny is you know the I didn't race much. I ran like two years, and I ran you know maybe. 30, 40 races. But then I had an opportunity, like I bought a blunderbuss car, which if you've never been, it's not familiar. It's like a, basically a hollow, a Strock Cadillac, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, And I, I ran it like a couple times and I'm like, man, this is just, it's not the same. You know, I'm not even getting anywhere near the same rush I did running a figure eight car. Like it's just, so I I know I can relate to them guys that like you see a lot of the figure eight guys just ran figure eights their whole career. You know, like George got to modify a little bit. Some guys got in there, but they all went back to figure eight racing because it's just so much more fun than anything else you could do. You know what, what's wild too is that figure eight division had its own characters over the years. I mean, you had, downtown George Brown, Wacky Chuck Lackey. You had, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you had John Fort and Chris Young, uh, um, oh, yeah. you know, Luigi with the flags on his cars, uh, you know, uh, what do they call a Paul over the wall, grow the wall? Or <laughs> yeah. Something. Like, yeah, the Beyond the Lillos. I mean, it was... Beyond the Lillos, yeah, the Beyond the Lillos. Um, and Riverhead, uh, Islip and, and Riverhead too. I mean, I remember when uh, Islip had only two divisions, figure eights and modifieds. Yeah. And there were like 40 or 50 guys in the figure eight division trying to get into what, 20 or 30 uh, yeah. spots that's, every week at, at Islip? Yeah, that's and, what my dad used to say. My dad said, if you just made the feature at Islip, you right. were doing something. <laughs> right, it was something back then just to make the, the feature. So yeah. yeah, figure eight racing, I don't think gets the credit that it does because uh, – I think more tracks should try doing it. Yeah. Because oh, it really is wild. Yeah. I mean, and, and like a lot of people think of it like a demolition derby. You know what I mean? They don't, They like yesterday, I was watching, we were watching Reed Halpin on the summer shootout, and Megan made a comment about um, one of the kids must have just got this car done and he had some duct tape numbers on his on his plain white car. And she made a comment about it, my wife. And uh, I said, hey, that's what my car looked like my whole first year. And she's like, yeah, well, that was a figure eight car. And I'm like, well, what's that supposed to mean? You know, <laughs> right. it's still a race car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were, I mean, especially the Riverhead figure eight cars were essentially, you know, late models. Yeah. I mean, there were guys that were using how road course chassis, uh, late model road course chassis for, for the cars and oh, stuff. Yeah. You know, my God, what a crazy bunch of characters. <laughs> I mean, you know, my brother drove for George Brown oh, yeah. for, for a couple oh, of years. Yeah. And just, there, was, <laughs> there was a lot of times George, George, like, George would make you shake your head. You <laughs> got to have a funny George Brown story. Oh, man. It, there's so many George Brown stories. <laughs> I can't even like none of them. I don't know. He <laughs> you can tell him here. Uh, we have an so, R-rated show. So we George, we had a you know, you had to figure eight guys where they all hung out with each other, too. So like even if they wanted to get away from each other, they couldn't because they'd go to a barbecue together. So we're having a party at our house. And uh, this kid, Jack, young kid, Jack, I'll never forget it. It was the son of a car owner or something. I can't remember. So George is like, a kid's young. I mean, he's fuck, 10 years old, maybe, something like that. Right. And George is like, Jack, come here. And I'm like, oh, God, what's getting ready to happen? So he's like, did I ever tell you about um, my Uncle Jack? He's, so the kid's like, no. And he's like, yeah, he used to have horses. And, you know, he used to he used to make me go over there and ride the horses with him. And you're knowing, like, you, if you knew George Brown, you knew this was not a sincere story. Like, <laughs> there's some fu- there's some punchline coming somewhere. Mm-hmm. And he's like, so, you know, my Uncle Jack, he would help me. You know, he'd help me get up on the horse and get off of the horse. He goes, but I would just never help my Uncle Jack off the horse. <laughs> and we're like, what? He's like, he's like, yeah, I'm not. He's like, I just couldn't help my Uncle Jack off the horse ever. He's like, I was just never going to do that. And I'm, and, I'm, and the kid's like, why wouldn't you help your Uncle Jack off the horse? And I'm like. 
I'm like, George, please stop. Like, yeah. it's not going to Let the kid go. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that was George Brown, though. I mean, anytime, he, anytime he spoke, you knew he was getting ready to fuck with somebody. Oh, right? <laughs> I've seen him do it, too. Yeah, and George, uh, definitely a character. Have... Uh, in your career, have you ever spotted figure eight races? I spotted, I think, one race from my cousin. My dad, you know, but my dad really raced more so before there was radios. Um, and, you know, a lot of guys didn't ever ran radios in the figure eights. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never got a chance to spot from my dad, which is a regret. You know, he was obviously really good. I think a three time champion, Wall of Fame member at Riverhead. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never got a chance to spot for him. I think I spotted one or two figure eight races for my cousin Ferrara and uh and maybe uh, like one of the peterson brothers um uh, but yeah other than that i never really got a chance to because a lot of guys never really ran radios what do you think is the correlation between the figure eights and the modifieds because we saw a lot of guys come out of figure eights and have success in the modifieds i mean chris young george brown uh who else ran figure eight? Jo- Fortin. yeah uh R- roger um Tommy Rogers, yeah. Fortin. I mean, all guys that won champ. All guys that won championships. I mean, George didn't win modified championships, but yeah. figure eight he, championships. You know, I think it was just you know one of the things is awareness. You know, like you have to be so aware in a figure eight car. You know, the like the way I was taught to drive by my dad and every and George and Joey and them guys was. You know, you're not you're not waiting until you get to the intersection to decide what you want to do. You're timing it when you're in the middle of the following corner. So you know, obviously, if you've seen a figure eight race, you're on opposite ends of the racetrack. You know, if somebody's in the middle of turn one and two, I'm in the middle of turn three and four. That's where you're trying to judge. You, if I look over and I see that me and my dad are in the same, you know, if we're neck and neck in the center of the corner, mm-hmm. I know I got to lift a little bit. He's going to be much faster than I am. He'll beat me to the intersection. I just got to give him a little bit of room. But that's how you're judging, and you got to be so aware of everything that's going on. And and I just think that you know, for one. A lot of them were, you know, it was modifieds and figure eights, like you said, for the longest time. Then they added these other divisions. Well, the figure eights were the second highest paid division at the racetrack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of them just moved to the modifieds because that was the only way you can go to make any more money, you Mm -hmm. know, and then they just happened to get better at it. But I think it was just a a case where there was a lot of really talented guys in the figure eight division, and and they they made that leap for one, from, you know, this is where I'm going to go if I'm going to make any more money. And two, that that was the premier division at Riverhead Raceway, obviously, and and that's where you want to be at. So I think it was just a, a culmination of really talented. The race car drivers and and maybe some of them just looking for some more money and you have to have brass balls for going through that intersection <laughs> you, you really do because i tried it one time oh when i was on the track crew there we were screwing around with the track trucks doing the figure eight you know with the the track truck and one of the other ones and one time i timed it wrong and we almost hit it the x i was like oh shit you know like, you feel like baba rock was gonna get pissed you know? <laughs> the uh my dad always told me a, a ping is good a bang is bad you know he said if you're you can get close enough to ping the guy real quick you know that that's just barely you know but i mean it, every time i it's so weird to say it but like when you're out there it doesn't seem close, you know, because if you know what you're doing, you know, if there's some people that I feel like don't know how to do it, you know, I was lucky enough that I had the wealth of knowledge that I had teaching me how to do it between all them guys. Um, you know, you, you knew when to judge it, you knew when to chance it, when not to, some guys are out there just, I'm not fucking lifting. I'm going to wing it, you know, and those are the guys that end up getting hurt. Um, uh, but you know, if it's, you, you know when it's I don't think it's close you know like I'll, I'll run one you know, and I'll be like there's a couple times you're squeezing through a couple holes that you feel like are the size of a school bus and you get in there and my mom's like the fuck were you doing out there you know, like, you know and I'm like what do you mean she's like you almost got hit and I'm like it wasn't even close and you watch the video back and you're like Oh, it looks a lot closer than it feels, I guess. But right. yeah, so I mean, it's really you know, as long as you know what you're doing, and and you know, you have a good idea of when to do it and when to lift, and and not, you know, it's it's not so treacherous. That uh, that figure eight race, and they do out of the speed drum is. Awesome. I don't know how they do. Have that. you ever been there? I've never have been there. We it? went. My dad went. My dad tried to go one year with Joey. Joey on a little ran. And like it's there's so many cars, you know. I don't know now, but there was back then. There was 70, 80 cars showing up, and they would they would make sure, you know. It used to be like Riverhead, like the field would dwindle down, so the intersection got a little hec- less hectic. Figure eight racing there, they just keep shending them out. Like yep. you know, they'll they'll have them lined up as alternates, and if somebody comes out, all right, you go. So they kind of try to keep 30, 40 cars out there at all times, and it's it's uh, nonstop. I I mean I I I don't know how they do it because I, there's they gotta lose track. There's so many cars, right? It's hard. So you can't like there's no way to do it the way I was talking about of you know judging it off the corners because there's just so many cars you'd get lost. So I don't. I, it's a it's amazing the the job they do. I can't imagine what your head would feel like after racing like that. Yeah. Just having to be on high alert for that yeah, long three hours it's a cup race <laughs> i mean it's just ridiculous you, you know and probably even more high alert than a cup race because you got cars you know coming from all sides yeah it's it's insane 
Uh, so okay, getting uh to to the spotting stuff. Um, how did spotting actually come about for you? Because you were, uh, you know, started driving at, at Riverhead one. Oh, before we go any further, tell <laughs> I got to change it really quick. Tell us the story of how you became a two-time rookie of the year. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Uh, I guess, you know, like I said, I raced in 99 was the first year I ran. I think I was 15 or 16 years old, probably 16. I think it was a rule then. So I was definitely 16. Uh, but, you know, so we ran one year and I was not good. You know, I was out there just kind of puddling around and, and ended up half time my car broke. So I was on the back straight away. So I ran, I don't know, I probably maybe had one top 10 that year if I was lucky. Uh, so, you know, that was 99. Well, then that car we sold, my dad sold that car to somebody else. I think maybe my cousin, I can't remember. And uh, so I kind of just made a handful of starts. Like in 01, my cousin Joe Larson had a car I drove for a little bit. And, and uh, yeah, then maybe 02, 03, I think I just kind of maybe ran one or two races here and there for my dad. And then uh, 04, we bought another car. Actually, it was the car my dad, Tommy Ryan, who's a, you know, Tommy Ryan. Of course. Uh, he, he works now. He's getting ready to retire, actually, from Hendrick Motorsports. He uh, he was like my dad's best friend. Mm -hmm. And uh Tommy was an unbelievable fabricator. Well, he built my dad a race car from scratch. You know, they built a, his old, little, a little Chevy two-body, a little Mustang two-body, I should say. And uh, that was my dad's first car. He built it in 1984. Well, in 2004, I had the opportunity. That's the car he won. My dad won I slip with the last night. In 2004, we had the opportunity to buy that car back. Really? So we bought it back. The Anthony Nunziata had it. Is that car still in existence? It is still in existence. I ha I have it. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do with it. The but last the, ice slip winner. Yep, it's still out there. I, and my whole family drove it. I mean, it ran around. It ran forever. It it probably just got retired five years ago, maybe. Really? It was, it was still going. Yeah, and we I have it. Restore. I have it. I'm going to probably restore it back one day to back to where my dad had it. Um, but... So we had the opportunity to get that car back. So I was like, all right, you know, this is, I'll pour some money into this, and this is what we're going to do this year, and I'll go race in 04. Well, 99, Riverhead, as you know, like they have a track point fund, and then the figure eights have a safer club point fund. Mm -hmm. Well, safer, I think I was the only safer member to run in 99, so I was the rookie of the year. Whatever. I was just out there, and it wasn't a very prestigious award. It got me a little plaque, you know. Well, then 04 was technically my third or fourth year driving. I didn't run full seasons for a while. And uh, we go to the banquet, which the, you know the banquets were shit shows all their own. <laughs> you, I mean, you were if you weren't drunk at a banquet, I don't know what was wrong with yeah, you. Yeah, right. So I'm sitting there drunk off my ass at a table, and Bobby Fine and Steve Halpin are the two announcers, and they're up there, and and uh, it's actually funny. Uh, Steve's brother Timmy was my sponsor. It was TimothyHalpin.com. It was a real estate uh, venture that he had, mm -hmm. and we kept the car at 454 Automotive, was where my dad worked. And uh, so I'm sitting there, shit face at a table, going, you know, there's only really one rookie that one person that ran uh, Dorothy Hyde. I'll never forget it. She ran a handful of races that year, so she was technically the only rookie. So she was should have got rookie of the year. And so I'm sitting back there and uh, just waiting for the awards to get done so we can go party. <laughs> really, honestly, mm -hmm. you know. And and they're like, and the figure eight rookie of the year in the TimothyHalpin.com. And I'm like, what? So he he my fuck. He sponsors other people. And the 454 <laughs> Automotive. I'm like, what? Freddie Kraft. And I'm like. What the fuck? I've been running for five years. I was like, so now, of course, now I'm going to put on a show because I'm an idiot drunk. So I'm waving to the crowd. I'm up on a chair at our table. And uh, yeah, and Dorothy Hyde was not happy with me. She chased me around the banquet for the rest of the night because it's at a hotel. And, and we were, she was very angry. And I was like, I didn't pick me. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Oh, no. I, I talked to Halpin yesterday and he said that she come up and gave him an earful and yeah, just let him have it. Oh, my God. That oh, is so funny. I was, I was dying out from this day forward helping and, and uh, Matt Dillner and them guys, they give me shit all the time about the only, you're the only guy in the history of the world to win a, win rookie of the year in the same division two times. It's, it's a, uh, it's a claim to fame, I guess. That's hysterical. It's fantastic. <laughs> all right. Now moving on to the spotting. All right. How did spotting come about for you? Uh, because you start off on, you know, the, the short tracks, the bull ring of Riverhead Raceway, and now you're, in the cup series every week how did that how that come about so it was really just by happenstance that i was i was actually working at riverhead after i quit race i quit racing in 04 i want to say i don't know what year it was i think I, I, I still spotting i think i started spotting by before i quit racing um but you know i think it was like 01 maybe 02 somewhere in there i uh my buddy jared hayes is running a late model 
and he had different guys doing it because he had just he had run blunderbuss, which they didn't have radios, and he had, had different guys doing it. And one of the guys he said was like, you know, Buzzy Erickson, local legend for us. Uh, he he said Buzzy got the second. The guy just kept telling me, hurry up, Buzzy's coming. Like no information whatsoever. Just hurry up, hurry up, Buzzy's coming. So he's like, I'm hurrying. I'm going as fast as I can, you know. Uh, so, but for me, the biggest thing was I wanted to be, you know, I was going to the shop and, and, and hanging out with them guys during the week and. It wasn't the same for me to to all right you know go put a, you know a couple rounds in here and get the thing scaled out and then just go watch it race and you're like oh I hope it does well you know for me I wanted to be involved in the race and I and I would I had been telling my dad how to drive for about thirty years at that point you know so uh, or probably not I was only about sixteen seventeen years old but you know so I th- my that was like an avenue I thought like that's something I might be good at and and I said yeah I'll give it a shot and it turned out I I was pretty good at it and and then so that I parlayed that into. Like I said, I spotted for Jared Hayes there. I spotted for guys like uh, Mike Andrews and Chuck Stoyer, Joe Hartman, guys like that at Riverhead. Rob Chobizio was another one around charge, car, Charger cars for a long time. So just kind of took it from you know driving to just kind of spotting for my buddies, and it kind of blossomed from there. And from there, obviously, you moved to the Modifieds, which is the top division. And um, how did uh, how did it how did it come about with going on the tour? Because that's when because you, you kind of moved up the ranks. The way a driver would from your local racetrack to a series to a national tour or, yes. or to a national series. So I was I, I was spotting at Riverhead. I don't remember who I was doing at the time. I might have been Stoyer. Um, and I was just, you know, we were winning races and doing really well. And uh, Eddie Partridge had hired Jimmy Blewett to run Riverhead. And I wasn't spotting for him there. Um, but I knew Jimmy. I knew the family. Obviously, you know, the Blue, it's going back forever. You know, they John won a Riverhead Championship, you know, years and years ago. Um, so, you know, I, I knew the family. I knew the name and somebody that I kind of, we kind of clicked at, at the racetrack. You know, and that wasn't working together, but, you know, we, we, we spoke a little bit here and there. And I was actually working during the week for Kenny Heggie at uh, his um, trailer sale or trailer rental place. And uh, Kenny got me hooked up with Eddie Partridge. Kenny was going racing with Eddie on the weekends. They were Kenny was actually driving once in a while, but I think Mike Curtis and Bo Gunning were running for Eddie Partridge in the TS Haulers car. Mm-hmm. And Kenny would either go help on the crew or he would go and race once in a while with them. So Kenny actually, when Jimmy decided, they decided at the end of that 05 year, I think it was, Jimmy had been running Riverhead all year. I think at the very end of the year, Eddie decided he was going to let Bo Gunning go and put Jimmy in the car to finish out the tour season. And then they were going to run next year full time. And Eddie had been doing the spotting, and they tell me all the time they're like Eddie's terrible. Like Eddie's, <laughs> Eddie's, Eddie's like Eddie. He's not that he's a bad spotter. He just was. He wants to watch the race. So Bo's running in the back, and Eddie's watching the really good race up front. And the next thing you know, there's you know Eddie's like, oh the yellow's out, and Bo's like, yeah, no shit, I'm back here stacked three high on top of somebody. You know, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> no. so uh, so we would, uh, you know, so they were like, we got to get another spotter, you know. So they're like, well, so Kenny brought me over, introduced me to Eddie. And uh, he's like, hey, Freddie's going to spot for us when we go. I forget, we're going Thompson probably for the World Series. Mm-hmm. So we turned that into me and Jimmy clicked right away. And I was with them guys for – I was with Eddie for a long time, actually. I worked in the shop. I started. I, I left Heggies and worked in the shop with Stanley Loiko and a couple other guys there. And um, On the cars. On the cars, yeah. Oh, okay. Don't tell anybody else that. Don't repeat that because I don't want them to know I can do it. You know, I don't, uh. wanna, I don't want anybody to expect <laughs> me to go into the shop now and start helping out. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so we worked a little bit on the cars. Oh, I worked a little bit on the car with Stanley and them got him ready every week. Um, and then, you know, we, we just kind of ran that together. I ran with Eddie for a long time until I probably ran, I think Jimmy ran 05 through like maybe 08. And then I stayed till 2010 or 11, whenever I moved down here, mm-hmm. um, that I was with Eddie the whole time. And I continued to spot for Eddie any, any chance I got, um, you know, until he passed away a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was just going racing with Jimmy and clicking. And man, we had so much fun in those days with the TS gang. And how was, many different, uh, drivers, did you win modified tour races with? It was what uh, Jimmy and John. So I went with Jimmy and John. John was the first one. That's a great story about uh, you know we Jimmy. Jimmy had hired. I spotted for Jimmy for about a year, and then they hired uh, Brad Lafontaine, the crew chief. And Brad was really good friends with Greg Narducci. Greg's he had a lot of experience spotting. So they were like, we want Jimmy to you know we want Freddie's kind of new to this you know and and maybe greg z can help jimmy a little bit more than freddie can so we're going to use greg z so we were at stafford and i was like damn that fucking sucks you know for me like we're over i'm already up here now i'm not going to get the spot so john comes over and we were talking about it and he's like wait you're not spotting for jimmy i said no he's like well then you spot for me i was like all right well sure obviously john was at the time john was the, the shit in the modified world you know right so uh-huh. i'm like all right so we we go out there racing and uh and this was this was him in uh, Eddie's car or Kurt Chase's no, car? No, this is actually his own car. It's a family car, the red, white, and blue. Okay, the red, the red white, white, and blue 66. Okay. Um, so he, so he, Jimmy was driving Eddie's car. And uh, so he, we ran together and then we, I forget what happened. We put tires on at the end and Jimmy stayed out. 
and we had to cut through the field, and we got there with probably 10 to go and, and passed Jimmy for the lead and went on to win the race, and I'm never going to let him hear the end of it. So my first <laughs> my first ever tour win was passing the guy that I got most of my tour wins with, uh, but it was his brother, and we went to victory. The, and the funny part is some of them didn't even know that I was doing it. You know, Eddie, I don't remember. We went down there, and they were giving me shit about it because I went. Jimmy had finished second, obviously. So we go to victory lane, and at Stafford, they bring all the, the, the whole podium down there. So they went down there, and they're like, what would you do? You don't even belong down here talking about you know me being down there for Jimmy's second place finish. I go, no. I'm with that guy, and we were going to Victory Lane, and me and John are high five, and they're like, get the. We went to dinner that night. Eddie's like, well, there's like five or six of us on the team. Eddie's like, we need a table for five and one for one over there. He's <laughs> he's on the other side of the room. Fuck him. So I was like, you know, that was just. I mean, the race with Eddie Partridge was probably the most fun I'll ever have in race. Eddie Eddie was great. He, he really was. Uh, and you know what? Really single handedly saved Long Island Auto Racing. Absolutely, a thousand percent. You know, because that that land is just so valuable, and for them to buy it knowing that it wouldn't be you know turned into yeah a, a walmart or something is is fantastic and we need more of that because we're losing tracks left and right yeah, it's unfortunate so, yeah it was when eddie got in when, when i heard that eddie was taking over i knew that there was that was it was going to be fine for a long time because eddie you know eddie he loved racing it didn't matter you know he didn't care that it was like you said it's it's way more valuable as a strip mall than it is as a racetrack and, you know, I'm happy to see that Connie and, and Tom Gatz have kept it going as long as they have and John Elwood. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're going through tough times, and hopefully they get it all straightened out and get everybody on the same page. But, you know, it's just you know, obviously it's home. I tell everybody all the time, they, we get questions all the time about where would you, where, what tracks, your dream track, and what's the nicest place you've ever been to. There's nicer places in the world, but if you told me, Freddie, you get to pick wherever you want to go watch a race this week, I'm going to Riverhead Raceway every time. It's really a great short track. It <laughs> yeah. really is. I mean, everything puts on a good show there. I mean, we ran the midgets there a bunch of years ago. Oh, my God. The, the excitement was off the chain Yeah, you know, when, when they would go there. Uh, same thing with the TQs when, when they went there. Um, also, from what I understand, like Riverhead is highly rated on flow. It's like one of the most watched racetracks because it's just so good and close and tight racing. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's amazing what that. I mean, that's something else that COVID I felt like kind of brought to the racing world was. You know, you couldn't go to the races. That's what. That's the only reason. You know, Eddie. Eddie doesn't know anything about the TV production yeah. side of things. You know, COVID brought streaming to the forefront. Yeah, and and when you know, we, like I we had been saying, I I was jokingly saying this for a long time because I had been living down here since 2011. And you, I couldn't watch Riverhead anymore. You know, I mean, I'd get updates or maybe somebody would go Facebook Live or something for a race. But other than that, you were just going off of the video that came out on Monday or Tuesday from Pit Stop Pitbull or whoever it was or Captain Video. And, you know, the 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 fact that I was I was like, man, put this shit on TV so I can watch it. You know, I am sitting around at night on Saturdays want to watch and, and yeah, whatever, you know. Well, then COVID, you couldn't, nobody could go. So then it was like. All right. Well, we're, well, if you charge twenty bucks to watch, and it went through the roof, and then it, it became a valuable piece of, and I think it, it, I mean, not just so much even Riverhead, everywhere. You know, there's everywhere. there's a lot of young kids that are getting their name out there, or Bubba Pollard, guys like that, that you wouldn't even know if there wasn't a such thing as Flow Racing or Racing America that that put some of these races on. Perfect example. That kid kill a cam. Yeah. Last week, yeah. okay, at, at Charlotte Motor Speedway with that big, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin speech he did in Victory Lane. He's what 10, 11 years old. <clears throat> I talked to Neil Cantor yesterday. That video has got like a million views and stuff. I oh, mean, yeah. it never would have happened, you yeah. know, fifteen years ago. Nope, it, nobody. I mean, it would have been a it would have been a story in a paper somewhere that somebody would have said, you know, that or a would, picture. Yeah, a picture like that would have been mm -hmm. it, and it would it would have had no effect right. whatsoever. But that video popped up on Harvick's podcast. I mean, I w went down there yesterday and and you know talking to him for the show. Uh, Flo just shared it everywhere yeah. uh who uh, kenny wallace he shared it too like it just <laughs> it's awesome it went viral how big is this to take the win this is so big for me i've this is actually my first win but i have one thing to say it's over baby it's over first place in the book and that's the bottom line because killer cam said so somebody give me a heck yeah Heck yeah! <laughs> so that's kill a cam. I mean, so. I, when I saw that, because I, 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 like you said, Neil Cantor's a friend of ours, and and you see the kid kind of wandering around, and like they're just like you could see he had that deal coming. Like you see, he's like, I got something to say. <laughs> oh yeah, he. I already talked to him in the, in the pit area last night. He says he goes, oh, don't worry. He goes, I got a whole new speech lined up for the next win. He says so, huge personality. Yeah, he, he's really funny. But uh, changing the subject really quick, uh, back back to the spotting stuff and to, to John Blewett, um, you were 
uh, you were there the night that John and Jimmy crashed and John died. Um, can you take us through what happened that night? Yeah, I mean, obviously not our favorite topic, but, uh, you know, it's I was spotting for Jimmy, and the two of them, uh, like if you go back and talk to anybody, there's not much video of that race, obvious for obvious reasons. But that was one of the best modified races ever at Thompson. It was the the Bud 150 or whatever it was, the August mm-hmm. race, um, which ironically we had just lost Tommy Baldwin a couple years before in the same race. Um, but we're out there racing our asses off, and they were. If you, if you watch a race at Thompson, a modified race at Thompson is one of the best races you can watch. I mean, there's Fantastic. crossover moves after crossover moves, and that's what they were doing. I think they were fucking with each other a lot more than, you know, like they would, they would cross each other over, then go back in the next corner. One would slide up and cross the other one over. And this went on for 20, 30 laps. Like it was a phenomenal race. And they'd get in there and, and I you know, knock nerf bars. And, and uh, for whatever reason, I think we ran something over. We were, we were front row. I forget how many laps were left. Uh, John was leading. I think Jimmy was second. I think John chose the outside. Um, and we went down into turn one and somehow under that restart or under that caution, I should say, uh, we ran some over and we had a slow leak in the right front tire. Um, so we went down into turn one. I could see the right side of Jimmy's car drop. And as soon as the right side of Jimmy's car drop, I knew we were wrecking because you got a right front tire gone down. Um, so we piled in the fence together. Um, he was on the inside. Jim, of John. Jimmy was on the inside of John. So we kind of just, we both went straight in the wall. Jimmy, the impact of Jimmy's car I mean, this is the most freak accident that, that could ever happen, probably. But the, the from the impact, Jimmy, the back of Jimmy's car raised up off the ground a little bit. And obviously, it's a restart. Everybody's all over the top of each other. Guys piled into John. With John like, we hit a kind of an angle, like like John's kind of door was to the back of our car. And uh, so the guys piled in behind him and kind of drove him into us on top of it. Um, but th- unfortunately, the the way the rear bumpers were on those cars, they they were sh- much shorter back then. So the the point of the rear bumper ended up in the window and, and hit John in the head and, and essentially killed him. I, I think you know I didn't know you know we were we were angry you know like you, you, we got so desensitized to it you know from you know for so long nobody really got hurt. Obviously, Tommy had a freak accident sliding through the grass um, there. But you know you see bad wrecks and you're like oh they're okay you know and and you get so desensitized to it. That when when it happened that night, I was mad. You know, I was like, "Damn it!" You know, we're now we're wrecked. We were, one of us is going to win this race. And the second I seen Jimmy get out, and Jimmy Jimmy got out, and he went and and looked in the car, and obviously, whatever he saw told him there was something wrong. And and when he when I seen the way he reacted, it was I knew like I knew I, I, I knew something was really wrong. And um, you know, then you know there is. I'll never forget. There's a damn. There's a loading John in an ambulance that night. The damn shooting star went off in the background over Thompson. You know, you can see over at forever out there, and uh, I'll never forget that sight as long as I live. And um, yeah, we knew pretty well, pretty pretty quickly. Um, we were still at the racetrack. Jimmy and I think uh, Eddie Partridge, a bunch of them, had gone to the hospital, and we were just there, kind of trying to fix the car, get it loaded up. And they they called and and, and told us that he was gone and. It was just, it was such a surreal moment because, like I said, you, you see wrecks all the time. You kind of, as much as we've been racing, you know, you right. see shit happen all the time and you're like, oh, they're going to be all right. All the safety and, equipment. And yeah. And, that, and it wasn't even, it was just such a free, it wasn't like John even wrecked that bad. You know, it was, it was such a freak accident of, you know, just the bumper going through the window and, and hitting him in the head that everything lined up perfectly where Jimmy's car had come just high enough off the ground and, and somebody hit John at the right time and, or the wrong time and, and, and just such a freak accident that you thought, everything's going to be fine. And then, like I said, once I seen Jimmy's reaction, I knew it was, I knew it was really bad. And and I I just hoped we spent the night hoping it wasn't the worst. And unfortunately that's what it was. I remember I wasn't at the race, but I do remember getting the news either the next morning and uh, just really shocked and really bummed because first off, John was always so good to me, you know, around the modified pits. Uh, He would always stop and talk to me because, you know, we were just looking for stories and stuff to talk about. And of course, uh, got really friendly with him after he won the the first North-South shootout, which was just a phenomenal race too. Uh, So yeah, I I know it, uh, that one really hurt to to lose John. And we had Jimmy, like, so the way Jimmy ended up in the TS card, Eddie wanted John to drive. Mm-hmm. You know, Eddie, Eddie was John at the time was the man in the modified, you know, mm-hmm. he was, he was winning races. Anytime he got in the car, they weren't racing full time, but it seemed like anytime he got in, he won. Uh, well, he had some kind of issue going on with his stomach. I think a diverticulitis or something like that. So he was going to take a year off of racing. So then he said, well, why don't you put Jimmy in the car and I won't race, but I'll come and help you guys. So then John was helping for a long time and, and he was working on the cars. And then when he got well enough to race, Eddie decided he was going to put John in a second SK car. At Thompson, so we spent that whole year, 
every weekend racing with you know i didn't know john much i knew jimmy a little bit from the you know working with him but then when john started coming around like we got to know john that was the year i got to know john really well and Mm -hmm. and just see different sides of him about how I mean, he was a bad motherfucker. Oh my god! And and, yeah. and you know he he. I mean, they got they get into fist fights with each other at the junkyard. Their John, Grandpa, and, and their Dad. You know, <laughs> they, I mean, they, they they didn't care. They'd beat the shit out of anybody they wanted to. And and uh, you know, it was it was it was just obviously really hard to to go through that at that point. You know. Yeah, I know. And, and you know what? I got to give it a, a lot to Jimmy because you know to lose your to lose a brother like that and then still get back in the race car. I, I mean, I don't think I'd be able to get yeah. back in the race car. Especially when you're, like especially when you're involved, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's one thing to lose your brother in a race car. When, it, when you lose your brother and like, we went to a, we went to a meeting. Um, it, it didn't end well. Um, you know, one of the drivers, I won't say his name. We got in front of the, we, he got the next week. I think we took a race off and then we went to Stafford maybe, or Thompson a couple weeks later. And, Basically, they were like, you know, there's no respect out here anymore. You guys are ra- – because Jimmy and John beat – they were beating bumpers. They were knocking each other around. Yeah, yeah. But you you know you can trust your bro- – you know, they, like you, you're not, they're not going to wreck each other. They're just – and and this guy got up there, and he's like, you know, it's aggressive racing. And, you know, that's maybe why we lost John. And Jimmy's like, fuck's this guy saying? Like, is he saying that I – you know, so so, so that, that was out there. Some That perception of, you know, you know that Jimmy caused this wreck that ended – you know, so he had to deal with that on top of it. And, and so when we got back out there a couple weeks later, we actually – the next race we went to, we actually converted – because that car was obviously wrecked. We we converted the car that Jim – that John was running as an SK at Thompson into Jimmy's tour car. So the, not only that, now the first race back is – in a car John's been driving all year. So how he was wow. strong enough to how he was strong enough to go through all that at the time and then I mean come back and really not miss a beat. I mean go right back to winning races. We won we won the World Series there that year in, in the SK and, and but not only that, to become the badass that your brother also was too. Yeah. You know, that that's the other thing. You know, to go through all of that and then to go become one of the winningest drivers at Wall Stadium, to win on the tour, to win, you, you know, like well, the the Turkey Derby, yeah. just all those big races, and just at Stafford, at Thompson, just, yeah, he just, he just became just as badass as yeah. his brother, man. Yeah, it, they're, they're both pretty, uh, they're both pretty wild. It was cool to see. Okay, so let's go to some current news now. Here, uh, <laughs> now you're spotting for Bubba, and actually you've been spotting for Bubba since the beginning of, not the beginning of his career, but the beginning of uh, uh, his K and N career. Yeah, yeah. And now so, Arca. Yeah. So back, you know, I was like I said, I was spotting on the tour for a while. Mike Herman Jr., I get a former guest on your show here. Uh, Herm's a great guy. Herm isn't is he? Herm is the best. Yeah. Um, he uh, he was spotting for Priest up there, and, and Ryan was driving Old Blue, and uh, we went. I forget. He called me one day and he said that you know I got this kid, a family friend of his. Uh, had no new Bubba Wallace, and they were looking for a spotter for K and N Racing. And Herm's like, "Well, I can't do it because he had committed, I think, to Ty Dillon already." Um, he's like, "But I got this guy that I know wants to kind of pursue this as a career up there, and maybe you can, you know, work with him." He's from up north, and he Riverhead Raceway and stuff. And Andy Santer was running Revolution Racing at the time, and I think he's probably just trying to get as many Yankees as he could on the team because Clyde was there, and there's love a bunch to get of Andy us. on the show. Oh man, Andy's the best. Yeah, uh, Andy and Sue, they took such good care of me for that year that Great we did people. it. Um, but uh, yeah, so we went. I, they signed me up for Greenville, so I came down. I was actually going to stay at Herm's house. We we were on a Greenville one week, and I think I think South Boston the next week. Uh, so Herm's like, why don't you just come down here, give it a shot, stay at my house. So we stayed. I stayed with Herm, and uh, yeah, we we went out, and won the first race right out of the box at Greenville. I didn't know. I mean, if you go back and listen, I've told this story a bunch of times, but we I'm screaming on the radio like a fucking idiot because like I'm I'm going down there thinking this is a 16 year old kid. I don't know anything about him. Hopefully we make the race at the time. The K and N series was no joke. I mean, there, there's every heavy the half the damn heavy hitters in the Cup series now were in that series I at know. the time. Well, especially <laughs> in 2010. I mean, look at the guys you had there in 2010. You had like you had Larson, you had Moffat, you had De Benedetto, you had Bubba, Bo, Ty and Austin Dillon. Uh, yeah. uh, you had Alex Bowman running for the uh, the Gaunt car every once in a while. The yeah, it was X team with Daniel Suarez and just yeah, everybody. Well, yeah, the guys that are in the Cup Series now. Yeah, so so, I, so no joke. We went down there and won that race, and I was like, holy shit! And then now I'm stuck with this some bitch. Like he. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we can't get we can't get away from each other. We've been together ever since fifteen. This is our fifteenth season. I met I met him and Megan, my wife, at the same year, and I, I had no gray hair at the time. And I don't know which one of them's giving me more, but I'm almost fully gray now. <laughs> I, I blame it on the two of them. You gotta yeah, you gotta trim the beard back a little bit. That'll probably get rid of some of the gray for you. But you know what though, I, 
I'm guessing or I'm assuming from that moment that bond was just sealed, you, you know, with you and Bubba as driver and spotter. Yeah, and, and the biggest thing was, I mean, I, he was probably, I probably drove him crazy that night, but, like, we did that whole season together. And then on top of racing together, we traveled together a lot, too. I flew in, and they would pick me up at the airport and then drive to the racetrack. Or, or when I moved down, I would drive to all the races with him and his dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so that bond became even stronger then because, you know, I'm always around, and we're talking about what's going on. and talking. I mean, he's more like a little brother to me than anything else. He's a very annoying little brother. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he's like a little brother to me more than anything else. And, and that's like a family bond. And we, there was one time they split us up. Um, he was going to run, he was going to run a couple of Xfinity races at Gibbs. And so then he was going to run their Xfinity or their K&N car at the time also. And they spent one year, they said, no, you got to, because you're running them Xfinity races, Freddie doesn't have enough experience. We're going to, you know, you're going to use Curtis Markham, I think was the spotter at the time. He used to be Denny's guy. Um, and Bubba just said it wasn't comfortable for him. You know, he just didn't have that comfort level he had when me, you know, we had been doing it for two or three years already at that point together. So then the next year he went to the KBM truck and, and that's when he's like, no, I'm Freddie spotting. And so then we got right back together that year. And then from that point forward, we've been always been together. Is, is, uh, uh, spotting in the cup series or, or doing it at this level different from doing it at, at like short tracks because there's things that you have to worry about with like arrow involved where you wouldn't have it at a place like Riverhead. Or yeah, anything. obviously, you know, there's a lot more arrow involved in like especially truck racing or, you know, plate racing and stuff like that versus, you know, I'm never going to spot the same at Riverhead as I do at Talladega. Um, but like, I, it's like, you know, we we're talking about yesterday, the the job is still the job. You know, the job, number one, is first and foremost is safety. Second is, you know, you know, feeding your driver information, uh, you know, trying to make them better. Um, and some of that information has to change from track to track, but it's still the job, you know. So, you know, I tell everybody, we talk about, you know, I tell everybody that wants to get into this, spot as much as you can. I don't give a shit what it is. If you, if you can do a modified race at Thompson or a mini stock race at Riverhead, it doesn't matter. You're only going to get better the more you spot. And then mm-hmm. and from like, you know, when I started, plate racing was the most daunting thing to me. You know, going to date, the, the, you, you got to think, when you get a job, somebody hired, Tommy Baldwin gave me the opportunity to become a cup spotter when Michael Annette started driving the Pilot 7 car. That was 2014. But you got to remember, when I got that job, the first fucking race I'm going to is Daytona 500. You know, you don't you don't get you don't get a a little build up to get comfortable and oh you know we're gonna go run you know Martinsville this week and maybe Charlotte no right. you come out the gate and you're running the fucking Daytona 500 right. and it's like okay well I sink or swim I guess you know and uh, so that's what you know that's that was at the time that was a daunting thing to me like holy shit am I ready for this like I'm, I'm and and now it's my favorite form of racing you know that it's just an experience factor and when you when you can do it more and more and more. You know, then you're just going to continue to get better at it. There's guys now that I, the same thing. There, you know, there's a kid now that's spotting for John Hunter. That you know, he was Ryan Blanchard. He was he was just in the spotter in the modified series. Mm-hmm. We moved him up. You know, I, I I helped him out. You know, a little bit and moved him up to this deal. And first, before we're getting ready to go to Daytona, he's like, you know, what do I got to know? What do I got to look for? What? And so you're. The more you do it, the better you get. And that's why I tell everybody all the time, I don't care what it is, just spot for everything. But from track to track, series to series, yeah, everything's a little bit different. Some of the stuff, especially aero-wise, when you get to that mile and a half and two-mile racetracks, it really becomes aero-dependent. It's Again, you're just going back on your past experience to try and figure out you know, where you need to be and, and how you're going to get better at it. For a, a track like Daytona or Talladega, you know, which is so huge, are you – watching the race through binoculars the whole time yeah essentially you're watching you know i mean right when they're right in front of you on the front straightaway you take them down just to kind of give your arms a rest for a second yeah um and then you obviously see so we have we have binoculars that they're not super zoomed in there because you need to still have a, a wide peripheral you know view of it so they have a, a wider vision so they're not like super zoomed in on the car um so you're still you're still kind of you know you you can't see great you know it's it's because you can't lose that field of view of you know if there's if i'm zoomed right in on bubba and and if somebody wrecks four cars out the front, I'm never going to see it, you know. Right. So, so you still have to have that big field of view. But yeah, essentially, we're through the binoculars every 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 lap. And you were telling me yesterday when we were talking that the super speedway stuff, you're not looking at your car essentially you're looking at lines right yeah it, it really does you know good to stare at your car you know and, I, and this really honestly is a lot of anywhere I and mean, if there's some places you got to watch your car to to you know help with lines and where you need to be if you know you're a little bit shallow on entry or maybe you're picking the throttle up or using a little too much brake which we have a lot of the smt data now which i can't stand to to help with that but why can't you stand just, the SMT I, I feel data. like you know i feel like you're giving away secrets you know what i mean like there's guys you're 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 telling every driver in the field how danny hamlin picked 
picks up the throttle and how he applies the brake at a place like Martinsville where he kicked everybody's ass. I feel like that should be proprietary information. That Denny Hamlin shouldn't have to share that with you know with everybody else. True, I you get know what that. I mean. Like yeah. if, if if you've if you've worked your whole career to get really good at something. You know, gonna, yeah. I'm why should, share why should you share it with me? Yeah. You know, so now you know we've we've taken the, the car is the same, and now you've shared all this data to try and make the drivers the same. You know how how are you going to produce good racing if everything's the same? You know, you know this as long as I do. You know, you have to have comers and goers, and obviously the setups are a little bit different. But if you're trying to put everybody in the same box of of being the same it's going to hurt your racing product. It's going to be, you're, you're going to struggle to pass. If, if I know Bubba's is going to drive into the two marker, well, then I'm going to drive into the two marker. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it, it's just, I, I don't know. I don't, it, it helps my job because now I don't have to, I don't have to guess of, it looks to me like he's a little hard, you know, driving in a little bit too deep or he's, he's using too much brake. They can tell you, you know, the other day they're like, yeah, we're using 10% too much brake, you know, mm-hmm. all right, Bubba use a little bit less brake or, or get off it a little bit sooner. So like that's in race that's going on, but yeah. So, you know, I don't even remember where we we're going before this, but yeah, that stuff there drives me crazy because you know, you're trying to just watch that stuff and, and talking about Daytona, you know, watching your car, you're, you you need to anticipate things at Daytona. You need to see it mm-hmm. before it happens. You need to see all oh, these three guys in the top line are really tight together, so they're going to have a lot more momentum coming to you than the guys on the bottom that are split up a little bit harder. So now I got to get there before they get there. Because if you try to react and oh here they come with a run, get up. Well, that's when you see the big blocks. That's when you see that's when you see a guy a little bit late gets clipped in the right rear or something, and then we got a forty seven car pile up down the back straightaway. You know, so right. if you're if you can't anticipate what's getting ready to happen and you're just trying to react to it as it happens is when you usually get yourself in trouble. So the, the the more you can watch the full picture and paint the picture better for your driver, the more successful you're going to be in those types of races. Do you think that the guys that are former drivers communicate that information better to the cars? Because we've seen, you know, we, get, we see guys like Stevie Reeves, Tony Raines, uh, uh, Mike Herman Jr., uh, Kevin Hamlin, all these guys that have driven, you, you know, and successfully over the years, do you think that they communicate and parlay information better than I, if you had hadn't had driven? I think that I you know I think that it helps. It's not by no means any kind of hindrance because for one, you you're sitting in the car, you already know what that driver can see, you know what that driver can hear, you know what that driver feels for going on, you know what that feel is for going on around him. Um, so. I think it helps. I think that, you know, I, I mean, I would not call myself a race car driver. I ran 20 figure eight races. Um, but you know, I feel like my spotting is, is better than most because of, I mean, it's, it's, it's more, you know, experience. It's more than that. You know, you're doing that more often and, and, and you, and you build, you know, build a memory bank of what's going to happen, what's getting ready to happen here. So, you know, I feel like driving definitely, gives you a you know an advantage of knowing what that feel is in the race car knowing what this guy can see knowing what this guy can hear what he can feel what's going on around him so now you know all right maybe this is he already knows this guy's here i don't need to feed him this information that this guy's running way out here and he knows that guy's out there i'm going to feed him information about what the hell's going on over here or mm-hmm. what he could be doing better to, to make himself a little bit faster how uh how much of a therapist do you also have to be <laughs> on the radio too because i'm you know, you you know, and I do. Race car drivers get hot. Uh, how do you talk them down off a ledge or something? So sometimes, you know, you know this as well as I do. That sometimes it's you might not want to talk them down off a ledge, but sometimes some of them, you know, you get fired up, and this guy's going to start hauling ass because he's pissed off right, right. now. You know, uh, so when you, when obviously when it be, you can see it becoming a little bit of a detriment to your lap time or something like that is when all right, you know, take a deep breath. We got to get refocused here, and it's just that's all it is. You know, for me, it's anyway. You know, you can see that's what the benefit I have of working with Bubba for so long is. I know I can tell when some, when Booty says something on the radio, I'm like, ooh, that probably pissed him off. You know, like you know what I mean? Like so now I can tell or the way he reacts to something I say, like I'll know when to filter information because a lot of times the, the information will come from the pit box mm-hmm. to me on the second channel that Bubba can't hear. And then I'll filter that to whether or not I think Bubba needs to hear it. Um so then so you you can kind of get a feel for or you see the way they're driving. If you know, if we're if we stayed out on old tires and we're starting to get run over or the balance of the car has gone away and we're losing positions, it's, listen, man, I know it's frustrating. I know you're frustrated right now. All I need you to do is get me to the next caution flag so we can fix this fucking thing. Like, don't don't, don't make a mistake because that's a lot of times, a lot of rookies, I fought this a lot with Derek Krause in the truck series. The young guys, they can go fast, but their race craft isn't great. So then if something happens, they got a bad restart, now they're trying, to, if they lose three spots on a restart, they're trying to get those three spots back when they get off a of turn two instead of, Listen, I know I'm better than these guys. 
give me 30 laps i'll get back to where i'm at mm-hmm. they try to they try to get it right then and there and that's when they make a mistake they get you know they rush back to throttle they get free off of two they right side the thing and now your whole day is ruined mm-hmm. because you you were trying to make up for one little you just compounded mistakes after mistakes so you try to get in front of that and try to just say, hey man all right well, listen that sucked we we still got another hundred laps to go because these races are so long that you can you can make mistakes and, and recover from. So that's the biggest part of it is just trying to all right, calm down. Let's get back to work and and we'll figure it out from here. But the, you know, like the worst thing you can do is fuel the fire. <laughs> yeah, fuck that guy. Go get his ass. You know, whatever. So that's what I tell everybody a lot because you'll hear that sometimes on radios. Yeah, right. You're like, yeah, fuck him or whatever. And I'm like, all right, that's not what you want to do. Right well, there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we heard uh, Larson and his spotter go back and forth yeah. uh, again this weekend, but. Um, Getting back to what you were talking about with the younger guys, and we've asked this question to a lot of guests on the show before, is what is the rush to put these young kids at the top form of racing? Man, I I, don't, I, I was just talking about this with somebody the other day, and it's it seems to me like the age has just moved up. You know, when we were growing up, you ran Riverhead in a go-kart forever mm-hmm. and then when you got to about 16 or 17 you thought about getting in a race car at riverhead you know you re- you were going to run a charger car or, you know if you are a legend car whatever it was right. you know but you ran go-karts for five years six years whatever it was i feel like late model racing has become modern day go-kart racing like these kids are getting in late models at 10 right. 12 years old and you're like i'm always of the opinion and this is this is for anything this is for baseball golf racing whatever it is i mean i can't teach a an eight-year-old, you know, I, I I could go driver coach somebody tomorrow, and you know if it's Reed Halpin at, at the summer shootout, say, you know, I can I can teach him how to how to do a crossover move. You know, I can teach him. You know, you open your entry up a little bit, you cut through the center and try to turn underneath that guy. But I don't expect him to retain. Like I feel like, all right, you know, we'll do it. We'll do it a hundred times. You hit a kid a ground ball a hundred times, and he's gonna field it just like you teach him. Just like you teach him. You hit him one in the game, and fucking all hell breaks loose. You know what I mean? So I feel like when you're so young. The, the the retention of information and the and the application of it is is so difficult that you know I, these kids are getting in this shit too young for one they're they're I mean they can get really hurt you know what I mean I I, I hate to see we we're talking about a, a there's like a ten year old kid running a dirt super late model somewhere and I'm like yeah. that, like where are these kids parents at I understand the parents say well you know he's been racing this long he can do it you know yeah they can do it. But it's not a question of could; it's a question of should. Yeah, you know, sh- you know, should kids be in cars that young? A- and the other thing that I also think we're seeing, and you may tell me I'm wrong here, we are also seeing the decline or the correlation between younger kids getting starting in racing and the drop in attendance at sh- racetracks because now that husband, wife, two kids that were sitting in a stand. They're in the pit area with a car, yeah. and those four s- seats in the stand are empty. And it's you know another one and another one and another one. So I honestly think too that we're not retaining the fans in the grandstands. It has now become more of a participant sport, where it used to be a spectator sport. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, you go to Riverhead. I watch Riverhead, and and Riverhead always had really good crowds. And they I mean, they don't have bad crowds now, but it's nowhere near what it was. But then you look in the pit area, and the pit area is packed full of cars. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's. And you're, to your point, you're running. We never had a bandolero across the Riverhead. Now there's three bandolero classes, classes at Riverhead, right. and you know what I mean. And those, like you said, those are ten. If there, if you figure there's ten cars in each of those classes, that's thirty cars. If you mm-hmm. multiply, that's a hundred and something people. You know, it's hundreds of people that were probably sitting in the grandstands last year. Now they're in the pit area. Right. So yeah, I, I completely agree. And with I'm that. not anti kids no, no, racing no, 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 no. because I was that kid years yeah. ago racing go karts and and you know moving up through the ranks. You know. I, I, it's just I think that you know you run into this again with every sport like my kid's the best you know what I mean and sometimes like I've run into it on the spotting side of it I've been very lucky that a lot of the families that I worked with didn't do this but you know I am you know me I'm I'm not gonna bullshit you like if you're making a mistake I'm gonna tell you you made a mistake you're you're doing something you know Derek Krause I I spent three years yelling at that kid in the truck series I don't know why he still talks to me um, but you know but it was <laughs> he's just, a good kid it was just you know it was listen you're fucking up you know what I mean like yeah. and the parents would call me and go I appreciate that you know but then you you run into other you hear other guys that would run through three or four different spotters because every one of a lot of the spotters if they're a good spotter is going to tell you the mistakes you're making you mm-hmm. or the crew chief whoever and if 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 the parents can't hear that their kids are making mistakes they're only going to hurt them you know they i mean there's been kids that run through 
primetime spotters, you know, guys that are cup winning, cup championship winning spotters, spotting for guys that say, oh, he's no good because he, you know, he told my kid that he fucked this. I'm like, no, no, that's not his fault. You know, that's that's you. You you can't hear your kids wrong, you know, unfortunately. And you run into that a lot. And I think that's the biggest thing is you got to be honest. You know, they're talking about we, we had a discussion on DBC about dropping the age limit, you know, for for the lower series. Mm-hmm. And I said, I said, I'm not I'm not against it. Because every once in a while, there's a kid that can come along. Connor Zilich is a perfect example of it right now. That I think Connor Zilich is probably, I mean, he could probably go run a fucking cup race tomorrow at 16, 17 years old, whatever he is, because he's he's that mature. He's that talented. You, you sit down and have a conversation with that kid, and you're like, holy, this kid's 17, you know? But the problem is you can't. But that's one drive. Yes. The problem is you can't lower the age restriction for one guy because then there's going to be 20 idiot 17 year olds that try to do it too right. and, and you're going to have a disaster on your hands so you know if they wanted to make it some kind of case by case because the 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 approval process right now is i don't understand what you know the obviously they have to get approved to run anything um and you know so you, the approval process is so broken that i don't like ryan flores i know he was just here recently you know could not he's a multi-time gambler's classic winner unbelievable race car driver doesn't get to race a lot because he obviously has a day job as a tire changer Mm -hmm. for Penske. So he doesn't get to race as much as he would like to, but he's a really, really good race car driver. He is phenomenal race car driver. Really? And he couldn't get approved to run the modified race at Richmond. When we have guys out there running around five seconds off the pace and you're like, listen, I get it. Like these people, we need these people, you know, that we need these guys out here, the, the, the Wade Coles and the Jake Moroz of the, the world, little guys, the little guys that are going to be yeah. out here and but they're not the speed. Yeah. But at the same time, how are you going to tell me? I mean, if you took a poll, everybody in that pit area would rather race with Ryan Flores than they would Melissa Fifield, for example, or, or Walt Sutcliffe, the guys that, you know, they don't have a lot of speed and you're not approving Ryan for that. Like some, some kind of common sense has to come into play of, you know, the, the, the approval process needs to be fixed. I, I get where you're coming from. I can see the the argument for sure because Ryan, <clears throat> he is super talented. Uh, so yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> but um, what is uh, you know? Now he's running at Bowman Gray. Yeah, and Which uh, I don't and, know what he's doing that for. Okay, Jesus. that's the other thing we got to get to. <laughs> All right, here we go. Now we're gonna stir the pot right now. Okay, <laughs> let's let's piss some people off because uh, Bowman Gray, you and Matt Dillner. Go back and forth like an old married couple. It is. It's so funny to watch. Yeah, and you know, it, you know, you know this as well as I do. Again, that it's easy to it's easy to push Matt's buttons. So a lot of that is me just being my typical <laughs> asshole self, getting Matt fired up because because you know Matt's for one, Matt loves Bowman Gray. Matt has always loved Bowman Gray, but now that he's the announcer at Bowman Gray, we've we've ratcheted this up to about a million. Uh, so now I get to now I get to enjoy fucking with him. And and if I'm being perfectly honest, I really Bowman Gray has a historic place in our sport. I mean, it's it's one of the most legendary racetracks right. in the world. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the thing that the reason why I give him a hard time is because it doesn't have that reputation anymore. Right now, and, and they have done a phenomenal job this year. I haven't, maybe aside from one instance this year, I haven't seen the bullshit that I hate. You know, the, the stupid idiots chasing each other around and running through the infield and T-boning each other when you got cameramen standing around. Right. You haven't seen a lot of that this year. The racing's been pretty good for the most part. I watch it every week. You know, but I, for, before Riverhead started, I watched every week. Now I try to go back and watch the replays. Did you ever see the video of the guy that got dragged? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's my point. Like, and, and the reason why I'm so critical of it is eventually, like, there was no there was no structure. There was nobody saying this is not okay. You know, right. like they were doing this and and there was nobody getting kicked out for 2 weeks or or the you know, they they guys you're waiting on somebody to wreck them. Okay, well throw the yellow and don't let it happen. Like you no, know, we're going to wait on this guy and let him fucking stuff somebody in the wall and have a brawl and and eventually uh, like anything else. You know it, they're waiting on him. Yeah, you know, but eventually like anything else, it's going to cross a line and somebody's going to get hurt. And that's that was my concern moving forward and that's why I was critical of it because you got these guys I mean, the late model deal, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, there's a guy flying through the infield trying to T-bone somebody because he spun him out, and he barely hits him. But if he missed him, there's that little cubby of where all these, you know, the track workers and the photographers are standing at. If he misses that guy, he's going to fucking slide in there and hit somebody and really hurt him. And that was my, that's my only real gripe that they, they have to rein that shit back in a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, listen, you know me, short track racing is my life. You know, that's, if I could, if I could make the money I'm making cup racing, do a modifieds and short track racing, I'd be back short track racing in a heartbeat. Right, right. Um, But it's like something like that. And you go around the cup garage. I mean, they did an interview with Kyle Bush and they said, you know, what do you think about Bowman Gray when they're talking about maybe 
maybe going there for the clash next year. And first thing he says is, "Looks like a shit show. You know, it looks like you know it's a circus mm-hmm. over there. They're they're just running into each other." And and that's not what that place is. That right. place is built on historic grounds, and and you don't want it to have that perception of the people that are are not there every week or are not watching every week. Right. I mean, they don't call it the madhouse for nothing. Yeah, I and, get it. I I. I I like Bowman. I do. I like Bowman Gray. I like going there. The, the atmosphere is wild and crazy. What I get nervous about is th- now that the track is streaming the races, you know, we are seeing, you know, the antics happen and other tracks and other people and with so in social media too. You see it when it gets shared on social media. Then you're seeing this 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 type of behavior at other tracks across the country. It's normalizing this type of behavior when it shouldn't be normal. No. Yeah. We, it just happened at Riverhead. You know, I was giving these guys shit, the blunderbusts of all divisions, the damn blunderbusts, where there's like four of them that are really fast and they race each other for the win every week. Oh, I watched that race. And, and you know, it comes out, the video comes out, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, and a guy waits on a guy and wipes the lead, you know, he takes the leader out, and it's a friend of mine, Jim Laird, you know, and it's somebody that I, I've known for a long time, and I've talked to Jim about, you know, numerous things with the sport, and... You know, he. I said, man, you, you make yourself look awful. You know, I mean, you just. I don't. Ban, you know, the kid, the uh, Cody Traola, I think his name is. He 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 spun him out earlier in the year, like opening night maybe. He spun Jim out leading the race. Well, I don't have any problem with you paying the guy back. Listen, that's short track racing. You know, if somebody, if you put that in the memory bank and and you got a, you know, you're in a position to pay him back at some point, I'm all for it. You know, that's that's the way this sport was built. But to wait on a guy, I don't. If you're running second to him one night, you want to give him a bumper and, and get rid of him or whatever because you owe him one. I'm all for that. But don't wait on a guy and wreck him. And now you, now you not only wait on a guy, you look like an idiot because you you wreck the leader while you wait on him. Now you also tore up your race car. And then mm-hmm. like now that like and your people that are helping you, whatever might be doing it yourself. Now you're fighting in the pits. Like it's just an awful look for a race that probably pays what fucking two hundred dollars and a trophy to win you know like what are you doing the fights that i get into with people on social media about you know using the bumper and all that stuff and and i get it you know it it, you know the the whole rubbins racing thing people argue with me left and right and you know you get if you get inside the guy and you're side by side yeah i can understand rubbing and all that but when you just go in the corner and you just punt somebody out of the way I'm sorry. That's just dick driving. Yeah, it, it I, really I can't is. condemn it too much because I spot for Jimmy Blewett. Still right. a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right. You know, you you want them to race it fair. But, well, here's the other thing too. If you race with respect, all right, or or if you if you race each other with respect and not tear shit up. You save so much. You save money for fixing the car. You save your time being in the garage fixing the car. You save yourself possibly getting your ass beat in the pit area. Yeah. You save a lot of things by racing with respect. The the, the thing my dad always taught me, and I think this because I'm sure you're in the same boat, you know, if we're fixing the car, we can never make it faster. Right. You know, if we're spending all week putting a body on this thing or fucking, you know, straightening the clip out or whatever – you know, we don't. If these guys are coming home with clean race cars and they're working on the setup all week, we're putting this thing back together. You know, so that was the biggest thing I always try to teach, especially young short track racers. Like, if you're a seventh place car, finish seventh. Mm-hmm. Just finish seventh that night and come back and make it a fifth place car next week. You know, if you try to take a seventh place car and run third with it, chances are you're in a wreck. And now instead of being able to you know work on the setup and tweak it and make it a little better for next week, now you're you're spending all your week trying to fix something. So the 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 take what the thing gives you and and, and keep it clean and and man you'll be you're only going to get better from there. Do you do you go back? Well, I mean obviously you go back and you watch old, old races, but do you by any chance get a chance to like listen to? your radio communications and think like what I can say better. Next so time I, I, I don't, there's guys that do. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of know, I, I'll remember like if I'm watching a race, I'll remember what we were thinking, what we were doing at the time. Um, Cause I usually only go back and watch probably the last race there or whatever I think is going to be the most comparable race to where we're going. Um, there's guys that sit down and queue it up and they'll watch the whole race with their audio back and, and listen to it. I'm um, not one of those guys. I feel like, especially plate racing. I feel like there's not many situations where, it's the same. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you're not going to duplicate a finish, you know, that Atlanta finish this year. What good's that? You know, I mean, there's some things you can go back and watch and pick where you needed to be a little bit better or, or how guys got their track position or, you know, there's stuff like that. You can go back and and figure out what we need to do better to get track position wise. But a lot of that stuff is just reactionary to, 
all right, how's this going to play out? And there's guys, you can go back and see tendencies of guys and who's more aggressive, who's less aggressive, and what to expect about the guys that you're going to be racing around. But I don't really, I don't put a lot into, you know, going back and watching and, and breaking down every fucking thing I said and every little detail. Right. Uh, you know, I think that it's just, you're kind of reacting more to it. And I, I don't want to be overprepared if that's even possible. Like where I'm, I'm expecting one thing and then when the other, the exact opposite happens, I'm like, oh shit, now what do I do? You know? So it's just, you're kind of reacting in the moment moment more so than anything for me for uh, a spotter is the goal to have uh, a truck race an xfinity race and a couple of race lined up for the weekend because just more spotting means more income right yeah for sure that's okay. you know that's that used to be you know the when we traveled on thursdays it was a lot easier um to to um you know you would go and and you would be there already you know mm-hmm. you would fly out on the cup plane on thursday because we had practice so you were there for the friday truck race the saturday xfinity race and the and the sunday cup race now it's a little bit harder because of the schedule change so if you're not leaving friday or you gotta you know sometimes like a jgr i fly on the jgr plane because we're affiliated with you know 2311 is affiliated with joe gibbs racing so i fly on the jgr planes well they don't have i don't spot for a jgr xfinity car so they have to give those seats to their, their guys now if there's extra they'll give me one but a lot of times there hasn't been extra they don't have a truck so if, if you got to early for trucks so now it's a little bit more difficult travel wise and frankly back in the day that it's, it's getting better now but i mean back in the day it didn't pay enough you know i mean it, it, it what we were doing going back and looking at it what we were doing for you're like man i'm an idiot but we were doing it like the team was saving the team was able to save so much money on spotting having me spot versus bringing you to you know say some truck kid wanted to hire, hire Derek derrick to spot for him mm-hmm. well it's going to cost them a lot more money because they got to buy you a hard card. They got to buy you a plane, a flight, you know, a flight. They got to get you a hotel room, a rental car mm-hmm. where I already have that stuff. So like, I was like, man, we're just, we're saving these teams so much money and it's not being reciprocated on their end. They're just, you know, they're doing they're it for saving money. They're trying to, they're trying to do it as dirt cheap as they can. And, and now it's like, well, you should be paying me this. If this, I'm saving you this over going to, so we got that. We're doing a little bit better now with that. And the teams are working with us and, and things are actually looking really good for spotters right now, as far as, you know, um, compensation wise, but you know, it's still, it's still a battle for us there. Cause as you know, you, you're on your side of the business, you know, everybody kind of works together. This is in all forms of sports. You see, you know, so-and-so signed their deal and he's the highest paid quarterback. Well, next year, somebody's going to jump that and you kind of try to keep everything, you know, moving forward. And then you run into guys that are like, well, I don't need to make that much money. I can do it for less and, and have a living. And you're like, yeah, so can the rest of us, but that's not how this works. Dumbass. Yeah, you know, right. like, like, you know, we're all trying to rising tides raids, all ships. Like we're all trying to work together to, to bring these numbers up. And, and so, but every once in a while you have that one guy that wants to come in and, try to undercut somebody and you just try to we try to vote those guys off the island pretty fast <laughs> <laughs> you've seen every aspect of this tree or this ladder system of of racing from the top all the way down to the bottom to the, to the grassroots uh what can be done to strengthen the grassroots end of the sport man i the the biggest thing i always harp on and it, it's again it's the make it into some it's hard to say because like i said the kids are are moving up so fast that they're trying to get to these regional and national series when they're so young you know you, you see kids out there 14 years old and that was unheard of 25 years ago you know yeah. that that kid was running a go-kart and maybe he could get in a legend car at, at the local racetrack now they're trying to run arca you know and it's like where you know so i think that's the biggest deterrent to, to that so i feel i feel like we have to take these series that these kids are wanting to go run and bring them back to the short tracks. I think I think the truck series should never run more than a, a mile except for, you know, go to maybe Daytona one time, go to Charlotte one time, and then go to the go to a you know a Dover and then put, put Stafford, you know, Pensacola. Right. Take these because because Which then, is really what the truck series did what, in the what beginning. It was built on. And you could have a local guy. You know, you could Keith Rocco can you know, if you're gonna go to Stafford, Keith Rocco can figure out either rent a truck ride or maybe even put a truck ride together because you don't have to have the best bodies and the best engines to run Stafford and be competitive if you have a good understanding of the racetrack. We just saw Justin Bonsignor put on a phenomenal performance in the Xfinity race this week because he's you know he's at a place where he's got so many laps on the modified that he could he could the job he did there was unbelievable. Um, so I think if you take these ARCA races back to these weekly because a lot of times they run short tracks but the, the short 
four tracks they're running don't have a weekly program. You know, they you, you think about Martinsville. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll modifies will go run Martin or the trucks will run Martinsville, but Martinsville's it's open twice a year or three times a year right. for the late model. Right? You know, so th- take it to these places that have a weekly program where Joe Schmo from. I mean, you remember the modified tour races at Riverhead? Like we got to oh, we're gonna get to see our guys run against a tour. That was like the cool. Part. That was the coolest thing. So mm-hmm. now if you, I mean, obviously you're not gonna run a fucking truck race at Riverhead, but you know if you if you could bring it to Stafford and. And and the Stafford fans can go. Oh my, Keith Rocco is going to get to race against these guys. You know, we saw it with Doug Kobe when Doug won the SRX race there. I mean, that right. place blew up. Right. So prime I think, example. I think if you, I think if you can bring these name these series back to your grassroots racetracks, that's going to only help. You know, because they're 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 not running their weekly shows because they're. They're, the guys with money are going and running ARCA at 13, 14, or 14, 15 years old, whatever it is, and and all these, you know, the Cars Tour, um, all these other series where it's more regional than it is local, and, and I think we need to figure out how to, how to kind of mesh them two back together a little bit more. That's, that's a really good point, and the other good point that I think that some of the current drivers are doing is going and racing short track races like Priest and yes. Larson and, and Bell, and, you know, all these guys are hopping in something every once in a while yeah, and, and, and going somewhere. And, and credit to Larson. I think that a Larson, is that year and he had his incident and he had to sit out a year and, and went and ran and some, and he came back and he was so much better. It opened up these the eyes of these owners like, oh, Larson's saying that that year of that drone and dirt helped him so much. So it let these guys, and Larson going to, to Hendrick, he was still going to race no matter what. You know, he was going to race no matter what they told him. What, so with him racing, that opened up Byron to go run late models. Chase mm-hmm. got a late model now. So these guys going back, and you go back and you watch these races, or I've gone to some of the dirt races. I mean, the lines of people that show up just to see these guys or get close to them, mm-hmm. you know, because they can't get that close at, at Charlotte. You the know, Smart they, modified races. I mean, there's a line forever for Ryan Newman, Bobby Labonte, yeah. you know. Yeah, they I can't. Get they couldn't get never get close to these guys before because they were running Charlotte. You know, then you, you, you Unless you know somebody that's going to get you a pit pass, you never even got anywhere near these guys. Now they're sitting behind their trailer, you know, drinking a beer and signing autographs all night long. And I think that's the biggest thing. We went to Chase, ran the Derby a couple years ago, and it was sold out. You know, I mean, there was that you couldn't get a ticket to the place. So the drivers need to do their part of trying to bring some attention back to the short tracks. And I think NASCAR and and these other series could help themselves by bringing some of their more regional touring series or or even national touring series truck series arca back to these weekly short tracks and and let their fans get a chance to see their their local guy go against some of the bigger names they're aware of that's cool you know we could sit here all day and, <laughs> for and sure figure out the, the problems of the racing <laughs> world can't we <laughs> we just need to build we got to bring medford back somehow we got to go Med- back. how cool was medford raceway Man, the, the, oh my so, god so that my, place lo- that was the springboard <laughs> for my career you know so, because real quick yeah we you busted off what Nine second laps at Medford. Oh. You know how you, you know how fast you got to get a sentence out in nine <laughs> seconds. We, my dad bought me a go kart. I'll never forget this. We went to Medford, and I'm, you might even remember this because you were announcing. I'm sure I was probably I don't know 13, 12, 13 years old. Mm-hmm. So we bought a go kart. So we were going. We were gonna. We bought one. George Brown actually bought it. I think. Um, so we were gonna go and race, but we had to go get some parts to put it together for the next week. So we go to the track and, and we're in Bonsignor's car trailer buying parts. And as we're doing that, somebody comes off a of turn two and gets up on two wheels and sm- he had an open face helmet, I think, and smoked his face on the backstretch wall. I was there for and, that. And my mom was there, and that was the end of my go kart career right there. Yeah, I, I was there for that. I remember the guy just got up on two wheels and just did the Tommy tip over. And first he. He was not. He first off, he was not wearing what he should have. Been. He was wearing yeah. coveralls when he should have been wearing a suit. He had an open faced helmet with the bubble goggles. And I remember uh, uh, at Medford, they had uh, four by fours cemented yep. into the ground, and there was a tire bolted to the four by four, and then it was plywood, yeah, plywood yeah. bolted to the tire. To, to, that was their safer barrier. Yeah, that was really. their, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when he come down, his face come down on the wood, and yeah, I remember he, he was. I mean, it was that was a bloody mess, and that. But my my mom up. said you can go in there and return all those parts because he is not driving this thing here or something like that. So that was the end of my go kart career right then and there. <laughs> Medford Raceway was such a cool little gem. You know, anytime I look back and see videos of that place, it just it warms my heart. And yeah. then I then I hear myself announcing and how hard of a New York <laughs> accent I had. You know, just yeah. coming off a of turn four. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, driving this cart. All four corner lights are out. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not up at the fence, get up there now. 
You know, yeah. like, oh, oh my yeah. God, I could hear the New York coming through so bad. That's but. what everybody gives me shit because I don't have an accent. I feel like I don't have an accent anymore. And it probably comes through a little bit here talking to you. But right. my mom, my, my wife will, should be like when I was, my dad would call about every week to talk about the race. And I would uh, write back to it. Like I, I'm mimicking his voice, I guess. On right. the phone. So you must be on the phone. Your dad, you sound like you're from Long Island again. When you go <laughs> home, right? When you go home back to Long Island and you hang out with family for about a week or something. And then I come back here and there, I have friends that'll be like, man, your accent is harder. It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Sharpened it up last week. Yeah. You know, but you know what though, for, for, 10 short years Medford Raceway was a gem it was so much fun I mean it was just a hangout spot for me like I would just go watch my buddies race and hang out man it was so much fun it was fun to to just go watch you know the kids of the drivers run on Friday night and then the next night Saturday we'd go run at uh at Riverhead, and then were you around for the West Hampton days? Oh at yeah, all? Yeah. 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 Okay. So. We, George George brought my brother out there. My brother was seven or so, like, and you know, used to go you, West Hampton. I'm sure nobody else was me and you have known this place, but you would like you kind of parade lap on the oval, but you would run right. a road course. Well, my brother would turn onto the oval every time like they go green everybody goes straight down the front stretch and he would hang the left onto the oval and he's out there doing they're like well he's gonna intersect with these kids like throw the yellow get this fuck. finally they're like who is this kid george has like got his head in his hands he's like i'm not going over there oh Somebody go god get him. but man it was, those were good days they man. were they really were I, I miss medford a lot and it would be really cool to see something like that come back around here yeah but um okay we are getting close to the end of the show we get we do have to wrap it up but uh door bumper clear uh couch racer uh you know 23 xi like, like we're here to promote we're here to plug so what have you got uh to, to promote and plug when's the show on when can we where can we find it yeah so uh dirty mo uh media always tweets are there all their social channels will pump the uh, links out door clear we record every monday morning we drop it depending on how much we curse and drive the editor crazy uh because for some reason they believe by the curse words i don't really know no, so, we don't do yeah, that here I mean, thank god <laughs> uh so uh so they'll they'll put it out sunday or i'm sorry monday evening sometime about usually about five six o'clock it'll drop uh so get that you can get it anywhere we have our own uh youtube channel dirty mo i'm um, sorry door bumper clear mm-hmm. um dirty mo has their own also also and then couch racer man that's something that me and brett dreamed up over a beer one day and it's really just <laughs> our way to fuck with people and usually annoy the hell out of everybody there's people like i was telling you yesterday but it's grown right yeah, oh it's, yeah it's, it's it's taken off pretty well and and we and we just it's it's like fun for us you know what i mean it's right. it's content it's merchandise we got some funny shirts you know uh ross chastain punched uh uh, who was it? Gregson in the face a couple of years last year. Mm-hmm. We we came up with a watermelon punch with looked like the Hawaiian punch uh, <laughs> shirts, you know. So it's just fun merchandise. Go, you can go to couchracershop.com and check some of it out. Uh, we got some cool, um, you know, Fourth of July stuff that you know that we got going. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun to do that. And then obviously racing, man. Twenty three eleven has been really good to me. Uh, we, I've been there since day one with them guys, and obviously this is my fifteenth year with Bubba, so we're uh, we're enjoying it. And like I said, it, it can be, feel like work sometimes, but we're still living a dream that that we probably only could have dreamed of back in the Medford Speedway days. Yeah, you know we, what we got to do is we got to get all you guys on one time you know Brett you and TJ yeah. just to sit here and have a big bitch session and to be guests on the show we'd probably have to have it at that bar over there but we, you know, we've had a whole bunch of guests that, that want to do it at the bar matter of fact we've got a special 50th episode coming up where we're going to have some guests oh, uh, cool. around the bar so we're, we're looking forward to that but dude thank you for coming I know we've known each other for years since we were teenagers but yep. I appreciate you coming in man, today I appreciate you having me swapping of, stories that was, was a lot of fun that was a lot of fun man. So, cool Freddie Kraft joins us on the Derek Pernasiglio show one to thank you for joining us and listening to his stories and remember to follow our youtube channel the derek pernasiglio show on youtube you can also follow us on facebook at the derek pernasiglio show and then on twitter instagram and tiktok at real dp show so for freddie Kraft, i'm derek pernasiglio saying thanks for watching thanks for checking us out and we'll see you next time bye <laughs>